you understand and I hope today I'll make you a millionaire. Anybody likes gold? Anybody doesn't like gold? Anybody likes money? Do you want to make some money? Are you working to live or are you living to work? Both of them. Both of them. You mind if I take my jacket off because we need to get to work. And after the band has been up here, it's hard for me to stand in the sacred place of innovation and uh, absolute talent and stand on the stage. So I'm going to come down at eye level so I can talk to you. I don't like presentations. I would prefer the conversation. <clears throat> and you keep me honest on the time because I know the bar doesn't like to keep people waiting. Uh, my talk today is about something that is very simple. I use the analogy of gold and dirt. In, in our language, we talk a lot in seminar and in using the language capability of showing the, the example of how two different things can come together to have multiple meanings. Gold is something that we have in the country. I was going to use oil as something we don't have. But we have gold in the dirt. And there's one thing we have a lot of. Ethiopia is a huge country, and we have a lot of dirt. You have to figure out how to get dirt, how to get gold out of this dirt. And that's what I'm going to help you do today. Our discussion, I want to give you a brief perspective on capitalism, what it is today, the change that we need to make. Secondly, on the context of Ethiopia, how does that relate to what we are doing? Because we've missed the Industrial Revolution. And we've just bought this thing called capitalism. We just want to get rich. Okay? The opportunities, what can I do? You open a firm, open a consulting firm, open a factory, uh, teach kids, uh, inspire people. What can I do to get wealthier than what we are today? And lastly, some feasible examples of what it is all about. There's the one thing in common you have heard all day today that is related to everything you do. That's one word I will leave you with, and that's food. The gold that you find in Ethiopia and what you dig out of the dirt is food. Yeah, I know it's very difficult, and it was difficult for me to leave a corporate job, come to Ethiopia, and say I'm going to produce food and sell it to some well-to-do director of Etika or Tesco or, or Sansbury and say, I'm here to sell you food. You think they laughed when you walked in and stood in the middle of London at Trafalgar Square and laughed and they said, you're from a poor country, what are you laughing about? Imagine standing in front of a German director and saying, I want to sell you food. And he's just laughing his head off saying, get this guy in here, I want to see him. <laughs> we send you food in Ethiopia. And now you want to come here and sell me food. That's what I do. OK, so the context, I'm going to do this very quickly because it's a heavy subject. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on these definitions. At the end of the discussion, I'll give you a list of books to read on some light reading that will give you the context of where you will go for the next 20 years if you're going to do business in Ethiopia. It will be related to food. Okay? Remember, there are 80 million people, and we're one of the largest countries in Africa, and the one thing we can do is not oil or gold or diamonds. It's food, in spite of Gilgal Gibe. So, <laughs> the perspective I want you to use as a takeoff point. Humankind, we've inherited 3.8 billion years of stored natural capital. We have inherited. It's sitting. We're standing on it. We're wasting some of it, we're burning some of it, we're misusing some of it, but it's there. 3.8 billion year store of natural capital. No bank has this, okay? Ermias is here, and he will tell you that there is no bank that has this kind of capital. In fact, the world in total, in natural capital, in dollar cents, has over $600 trillion of value. That's been calculated. So what has humankind done? 
we've developed a highly inefficient and wasteful model for the utilization of this natural capital. It was called the Industrial Revolution. Remember what it was in the factories. You put in a lot of raw material, it comes out the other end as some product, 30, 40, even 60% of it is wasted. There's no economic model what to do with the waste, but there is a product that is delivered. Electronics, automobiles, clothes, detergents, whatever you want to call it. It was produced in a model that has better than 70% inefficiency in the way the Industrial Revolution came. Aren't we happy to be in Ethiopia where we missed this great thing called the Industrial Revolution? We have an opportunity in our lifetime to build on a country that has natural capital, okay? The next Industrial Revolution, really the model of how things change economically for the way we live, is simply natural capitalism recognizes critical interdependency, the critical interdependency between production and use of human-made capital and the maintenance and supply of natural capital. How we manage the natural capital we have includes human beings. In the Industrial Revolution, did not include human beings. Because remember those uh, Lucy uh, comedy shows where they were making the chocolate things? They were not human beings. They were used as machines. Okay, there was no participation. Remember the conductor? If you had people participating and use their creativity, their efficiency, you had a different way of managing that natural capacity of the human being. So, the context of Ethiopia. In our hands, in Ethiopia, what we have, human capital, 80 million people, okay? Human capital in the form of labor, intelligence, culture, and organization. It's here today. I know we talked about management issues during lunchtime with some of you who are here, uh, but that's a developmental issue. It's our responsibility to make that work. The second portion of this is financial capital. It exists, it's here. The banks are here. You see most of the banks are making two, three hundred million bur profit. In the six years I have been here, I have seen from almost no banks to lots of banks to over 1.5 billion bur in profit per year in a country that's considered poor. Something is not adding up here. There is money in Ethiopia. And there is wealth in Ethiopia. Are we using the natural capital in the way we can optimize the dispersion of capital and wealth for more of us, more people? Manufactured capital, including infrastructure. The government is pouring billions into infrastructure. Let me give you a simple example. One of the partner countries to Ethiopia is spending over 200 million pounds a year in Ethiopia. The second best country that is supporting Ethiopia is spending over $150 million a year. So let's go down the list of the United States, the European Union, China, etc., and add it up. That's a lot of capital. It's been going on now for about 15 years. Let's do the math. Is that close to about 900 billion birth that has come into Ethiopia? How many of you can count that money in your pocket right now? Okay, that, that's the significance of the utilization of capital in the industrial model versus the utilization of capital in this new model. The natural capital, of course, what we talked about, excuse me, let me go back to manufactured capital, the machines, tools, and factories are missing here. But what we do have is over 60 million people who are directly dependent on smallholder farmers. That's industry. That's industry. We are able to sow, grow, and reap a significant amount of natural resources, natural products, which we have not done anything with in terms of value addition or processing. Let's accept that. TEF is a good example. TEF is a superfood, which we have completely underutilized. Beware, because some person out there, maybe in China or someplace else, is gonna be selling us TEF pancake in a box at Shoa supermarket, imported from Taiwan or from New Delhi or from, even worse, Dubai. 
we are buying juice from Dubai. Have you seen a juice tree in Dubai? Have you seen any tree growing fruit in Dubai? But our supermarket shelves are full of juice from Dubai. I could accept it from South Africa, but we have a surplus of food in Ethiopia. We have over 2,800 hectares of banana. Okay, have you heard Ethiopia exporting banana? How many hectares of coffee do we grow? Anybody know? It's about 4,000 hectares. And we have 2,500 hectares of banana and it's not being exported. And we ask the question, why? Do you have banana flakes? Dry banana? Does anybody find it in Addis? No. Does anybody find banana smashed in bottles for baby food as a nutrition uh, supplement to children? No. What do we have in the supermarkets? Gerber's, baby's food. Do we have sweet potatoes in Ethiopia? Yes. In the southern region, there is sweet potato. Do we have it in Addis as a chip, a powder, or a food product? No. So that's the issue of manufactured capital and natural capital. And are we using it? It's made up of the resources, the living systems, and ecosystems in Ethiopia. There is a surplus of water. So 80 million people, lots of water, plenty of food production. We know how to do it. But in Addis Ababa, we buy pancake made somewhere in Louisiana, packed in Jeddah, and comes to us in carton boxes that are not recyclable. Okay, that is completely contrarian in terms of our development. And those of you who are here today, I'm going to challenge you on how you're going to make a million bird in a very short time if you get the drift of how this model is not working. It is not working for us. So how do we proceed? Food production. That one word I told you to leave with today is food. Do you remember the old movie with uh, Mrs. Robinson? Uh, what was that uh, movie with uh, uh, Simon, whatever the, the singer was? Okay, at that, huh? The Graduate, okay? In the 1960s, there was a movie called The Graduate. At that time, the buzzword was not food. It was plastic, plastic. They, the whole world was changed in the 1960s when plastic entered everything. It earned packet, packeting, it, er, it, it entered automobile manufacturing, etc. Now it's food. We are in a zone that is about 150 million people and growing. And there is one thing they have in common, other than killing each other. <laughs> Dr. Costi knows about that, and he's ex experienced it enough, but it's food. 150 million people. You take a little dot in the middle of Addis and draw a circle. If your map is a 1 to 100, you'll very quickly find 150 million people who need food. And 80% of the land mass in that area cannot produce food, except in Ethiopia, southern Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. So where the biggest country in that group, when Sudan is split up, is Ethiopia. Thank you, southern Sudan. <laughs> food production. Most of Ethiopia's agriculture production is natural capital based. Not many farmers are getting loans from banks. Not many farmers are using plastic tubes and pipes and tractors. They are using what they have available. But what is happening now is the industrial revolution model is being imposed on the farmers and they are using tremendous amounts of nitrogen. Okay, do you hear about Ethiopia importing? You hear about Ethiopia exporting? But Ethiopia is importing over $800 million worth of fertilizer. One of them is a high nitrogen fertilizer, man-made and artificial. We are putting it back in the soil at the rate that the soil cannot absorb it. Now, how would we replace that? It's what these farmers mostly do because they can't afford to buy this fertilizer. The biggest importer and trading company is the government. They, they import urea and DAP. These are the two biggest fertilizers. That's huge amounts of foreign currency going out of the country. And by the way, we can produce DAP in Ethiopia from the Dalol area, from Danakil. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. So you can mine gold in Dalol or in, in the Danakil area, and that's tremendous amount of money in foreign exchange that you can save the country, and you can also export it. So. 
what would we do? <clears throat> the opportunities we have, enhanced product availability. You heard this morning, Dirk, I think it was, who talked about the urban population increasing 4.9%. That's huge. That's a lot of people who need Shaw Dabovit, right? So what are we doing? Have we done really proper thinking about how to produce injera with natural, natural capital and make it available to this increasing population? Have we thought about producing Dorowat ready-made so the busy lives you have with your children in school, mom's working, dad's working, and the maid's too expensive, and you're living in one of these gulags, the new apartments, and you gotta fix dinner. Are you gonna take a wood, chiraro, and light that up? Or are you gonna buy kerosene and blow up your house? You're going to look at Gilgil Gibe and hope the electricity's on and warm up some food. But who's gonna make that food for you? It's gotta be available ready-made. It's gotta be ready processed. It's gotta be ready naturally produced here. Do we have it or are you gonna get pancake from Dubai? Or better yet, noodles from China with MSG and other goodies in it, okay? Monosodium glutamate, that's good for you? Not so sure. Value chain analysis. Here's the opportunity. We have TEF, we produce huge amount of wheat. We produce huge amount of corn, huge. Bokolo, what do we do with it? Do you see it in the supermarket? You see it on the side of the street, right? Bokolo season, toasted, we don't give it to cattle to increase our milk production. We don't cook it and process it. We don't make oil out of it. Where do we get our oil, cooking oil? Dubai, bravo. And where else? Malaysia. What do they sell us? Food that would not be allowed to be consumed in European community countries and food that is banned from California called cooking oil that is bad for you. Ethiopia in 10 years, if we continue to eat this oil, will have a huge health problem. So we will have cooking oil, but in 10 years, we'll all be lined up at Bramrungard Hospital in Thailand because we have dumbazat and sukwar and all that stuff and arthritis. So why aren't we making oil? The best oil to eat is olive oil. Sorry, we can't grow olives so easily in Ethiopia at this time. As an agriculturist, I'll tell you that's not coming through. But we can grow corn, and we do grow corn. We don't make cooking oil out of corn. So are you ready to invest in corn? Are you ready to grow corn and do something other than that? Where's the glucose we use in the hospitals come from? It's imported. But we have corn that we could easily process with what we have here without huge factories and produce glucose. And from corn, we have feed for cattle. A cow that eats fresh corn increases milk production by 25%. The typical Ethiopian cow produces 35 liters compared to an American or a European cow, 60 liters. Same cow. Okay? It's the food. It's the food. Okay? Value chain analysis. We have lots of good stuff in the supermarkets. What's happening after we eat the food? We eat the cornflakes, but we're not using our own corn. So we throw away the, the box. Then we grab the little thing they put it in called a festo, a plastic bag, a notorious thing that is choking the country. It's choking cows. Crocodiles, hippos, it's choking people. And what do we do with it? We don't understand the linkage between production with some valuation of biomimicking. Biomimic mimicking means trying to do what nature does in the natural things that we should be doing in our production. So now that I have given you this background, let me go to the examples because the time, and I want to challenge you and show you how you're going to make a million birds. We have cereals and grain-based product development in Ethiopia. We have TEF, which is a superfood that you must invest in for the sake of your children and the sake of your future. 
if you don't get involved and understand the implications of what's going on about death, you'll wake up one day and it'll be something you used to know. I guarantee you that. And you'll be buying it by the sack and it'll be coming in here by container from somewhere in northern China. It is a superfood and it is indigenous to Ethiopia. We know how to grow it. We know how to process it. But we haven't packed it. We haven't done anything with it. We make great injera. By the way, it's a great business exporting, excuse me, exporting injera to Ethiopians who live abroad. It's a great business. But let's get the business here also going. That's good. We ought to be doing more of that. But we need to figure out how to package and make fresh injera and make it available to everybody. There's a woman I met from Thailand. You know what she told me? She makes hot cereal from teff. Like oatmeal. Yeah, like oatmeal. Okay, by the way, we grow oats and barley. So when you buy uh, those uh, ping pong uh, food items in the boxes from Shawa and Novis, etc., at 70 burr a box, you know what it is? It's stuff that left here oats, barley, wheat, rice. These are the basic cereal crops that you turn into new foods and present them in a more palatable way, in a more manageable way. So I'm not proposing that you make sugary uh, processed food, but I am suggesting that there is a place for processing the raw materials that we make and stop exporting them in big containers. They ought to be given to Dirk and his gang so we can um, make uh, good universities with these containers and stop using them for bring, sell, sending back our food. Oh, by the way, let me talk about sesame. Everybody know what sesame is? You eat sesame? Where do you find sesame in Addis? On any food item? Bread. Double, yeah, bread, right? How much sesame do you think we're consuming in Ethiopia, sprinkling it on bread? Very little, not even a container worth a year, okay? Not even a container worth. How much are we shipping out of the country? Tons, hundreds and thousands of tons. Do we make oil from sesame here? Do you know how much a bottle of sesame oil costs in a, in, a, in a supermarket in New York or in London or in Dubai? A bottle, half a liter bottle is almost $12. That's a lot of sesame. But we're not doing it. We're just sending the stuff out. And by the way, we're importing tahina. What is tahina? Tahina is sesame butter. We're importing it. It's in the supermarket. You can find it. What do the Arabs do? They're smart. They buy raw materials from us, turn it into tahina, and say, here, have some. <laughs> and it's a major food item in the Middle East, and we're the producers. That you don't see Ethiopian tahina on the shelves in Beirut, or in Cairo, or even in Uzbekistan and Armenia, where they consume tons of this stuff. We don't do value addition, market tracing, or any kind of value chain analysis. We produce and send. What's that syndrome? It's the coffee syndrome. You like my coffee? I'll send you some. Do we roast it? A little bit. Do we pack it? Sometimes. But we don't sell it that way. We sell it in nice little cups. And it's more expensive in Addis than other places in the world. That I don't understand. Cattle and poultry. Okay? Cows and chickens are huge machines. These are natural capital that we have available here. That uh, I will give you a quick test, and I know I'm probably going to push my time. But let me ask you about cattle or cows. Ethiopia is in the top 20% in the world or top 50%? In the top 5%. In population of animals, we are in the top 5% in the world. Chicken costs more here than in Dubai. We're paying 179 to 180 burr for a small bird in the retail shops in Addis Ababa. How much is it in Dubai? $3. Where does the chicken come from in Dubai? Brazil. Brazil, okay? How far away is Brazil from Dubai? Very far. You got to do a lot of samba to get there, <laughs> a lot. 
and it's five to 10 containers a week, okay? Five to 10 containers a week. And there's a chicken shortage in Addis. Guess what? It's a business opportunity to produce food, not just for us, but for the 150 million people around us. The stuff is flying over our heads. Fine beans are exported from Ethiopia around 300 to 500 tons a year. I'm part of that business. It goes to Europe, it gets repacked as European beans, they call them Arico Vera. Comes in a nice package, lands in Dubai. And then to Saudi Arabia, etc. A buyer in Saudi Arabia told me 150 containers a week, fruits, vegetables. I said, from Ethiopia? He said, no, no. How much from Ethiopia? Half a container a year. Yeah. Djibouti buys fruits and vegetables from us. But you wouldn't eat those fruits and vegetables. It's huge business, but absolutely no value addition. It's the worst shimkurt from Addis goes to Djibouti via Deridawa, by train, etc. So think about this model and what's going on. Smallholder, smallholder farmers, the majority of Ethiopian farmers, these guys are the breadbasket of Ethiopia, produce a tremendous amount of stuff. But the traditional history is from the farmer to the market, there's about a 400% markup. The farmer gets the worst business. My brother is a banana grower. He gets two dollars per kilo, two bur per kilo, for a banana out of the Arba Nigeria. Two bur per kilo. How much do you pay for a banana? It was twelve last week, wasn't it? Because they shut them down. The farmer said enough. They shut down sending bananas via the third, fourth, fifth parties, and they said we want to get directly to you guys. You ought to be going home to your kids with a bunch of bananas for four bur. The farmer's not getting that. The same with shimkurt. The same with a lot of products. So the cultural cuisine-based product development, we need to get that. We need to produce injera in a way that makes sense so that the people who are moving into these huge, beautiful apartments are able to get food when they need it and not have to buy crackers and cookies for their children. Okay? Speaking of crackers and cookies, is anybody here interested in making candy bars? Healthy bars? Do you know how much it costs to buy those things? She knows because she sees kids every day. This is a snack. We have wheat, we have barley, we have oats, we have molasses from our sugar companies, and we have packaging. Why aren't we making candy bars? Why are we buying? Africa in general is a net importer of chocolate and candy bars. Africa produces more sugar than Europe. Africa produces more chocolate, or actually more cocoa than Europe. But we import more finished chocolate products into Africa, more finished sugar products into Africa, and we don't do it here. These are not huge factories. We're not back to the industrial model. I'm talking about natural capitalism, using the resources we have here. We have eucalyptus trees, zigba, warka, all these trees that we could turn into pulp and make cartons and boxes and packaging materials that are recyclable. We should ban the plastic bags and start using jute and start using uh, sisal, which grows. You, you drive to uh, Sodere or Langaro or uh, Koka area and you see jute. What, what is the jute tree called in America? It says, Gacha. Okay? It's there. A Gacha factory, by the way, in India, I understand, costs around 100,000 burr, a small Gacha factory, to make Gacha bags. So why not? It creates employment, it's natural, it will disintegrate in the environment, it does not leave any residues. It has no toxicity and it helps the soil because it's adding fiber to the soil. If we recycle things like corn and chaff of wheat, etc., we are creating a natural environment where we are replacing naturally depleted nitrogen instead of chemically added nitrogen. We don't need accelerants and defoliants we have insects and we have natural products that can do it for us. Before I go into the business model, I want to uh, give you some names and we will have this, uh, Yodit, you'll help me get these names on the website. So people who want to read. These are inspirational readers 
who actually got me started into coming back to Ethiopia. I came to Ethiopia because I wanted to be home to deal with this issue of food production and what I can do. My little 20 hectare farm is producing and exporting legumes to Europe, but we're very small. But I can help by participating in these kind of events and share with you that these are inspiration writers who talk about the model of forming new ways of thinking in companies and businesses and what we have in Ethiopia. It's a much deeper subject for me to go into than right now, but I would recommend that at any point in time that you get a chance to pick up one of these books, read it, especially the Natural Capitalism by Hawk and Lovins and Lovins. This is a delightful book. It applies to architecture firms, automobile manufacturers, laughter therapists, children programs, and lots of other sectors of our business life that we need to start thinking in terms of the more modern way. So let me now stop this presentation and talk to you about making a million burr. I promise you you're going to leave here rich, okay? Where are you, my banker friend? Did he leave? Hermias, you're there. The light is in the way. Okay. This is Hermias Sushete from Zaman Bank. I'm picking on him because he's here from a bank. And I think one of the most interesting and well-developed banks in the country. I want you to start thinking about one thing. Anybody here own a car? Quite a few people. Maybe 30, 40% of us in here own a car. Value about 150,000 burr in that range, about 70,000, 70,000 to 150,000 burr, okay? If I would ask you to find 10,000 people like you who can afford to take 10,000 burr out of their life and form a company, how much would that be? 10,000 people, 10,000 burr? How much? 100 million, is the math right? Okay, there's a huge corporation. What would we do? How about chicken? Okay, could we quickly get into business in less than 90 days? The land is free, by the way. It's a big thing we are in Ethiopia is that you have this huge opportunity of land that is free. Look at Karturi, look at Saudi Star, hundreds and thousands of hectares for nothing. Why shouldn't we take that for 100 million burr? Aren't we as good, as big as any of those companies when we raise 100 million burr? 10,000 of us with 10,000 burr have 100 million burr. We're going to go ask for 2,000 hectares. And we're going to go raise the hell out of some chicken. Okay? What are we going to do? We're going to grow grains to feed the chicken. When we harvest the grain, we're going to take the chaff or the legs of the, of the stalk of the stem of the grain and recycle it back by buying a chopping machine. We're coming to that technical agriculture college and we're gonna ask you to make us a machine to chop this and turn it into a almost powder so we can plow it back in the ground. There's our fertilizer. 30% of your agriculture input, you'll get it for free by growing the grain. You're gonna grow corn because you need corn to feed chicken to fatten them up. You don't need hormones like we do in America, okay? Hormones in chicken is the quickest way to make the chicken grow huge. And it's the quickest way to create problems for children who cannot process the hormones in their young systems. So we get all kinds of cancer and other aberrations in nature. But we can do this, and we can grow chickens in a very short time and be in the market. So how, how many people with 2,000 hectares employ? Take about 20 people per hectare, okay? That's a lot of people you immediately gave jobs to. Where would we be? We'd be far from Addis. So what would we do with the chickens? We get chicken, we get eggs, and we get the chicken manure, which is another fertilizer, rich in nitrogen. You stop buying DAP and urea, okay? Then what do we do with the chicken manure? We can produce biogas and run our tractors with biogas. We can run biogas from our corn fields in 2,000 hectares. So we would cut our fuel consumption by 50%. We use solar energy to warm up the homes of the chickens. It's free. Okay? Bye-bye, Gilgal Gibe. Then comes the feathers. Do you know you can use chicken feathers? 
It's a huge industry. It's called feather meal. We could export that and bring in foreign exchange. That would actually help us run the business when we need to buy spare parts for the tractors. Okay? Now we've created employment. We've created a cycle of life. What Rick was referring to in his, uh, Dirk was referring to in his earlier uh, presentation of what you produce ought to have residue that you come back and reuse in your business. Okay? So 100 million per investment with a return of investment in about 18 to 24 months. What could we count as margin in that kind of business? What would be a good margin target? How much? 30, 40% margin, gross margin. So out of every burr that you invest, you're gonna get 40 cents, 30 cents back, burr. That's not bad. How much you get in the bank if you had 100 million saved? 5.5% is the best deal from Zeman Bank. Yippee, <laughs> you can buy bread now. <laughs> Let's think about this. I want somebody to be that guy on the field with the arms flying around, the number two guy to call me tomorrow and say, let's get this boat on the road, okay? Let's float this idea. Let's get out there. Let's create 100 million Ethiopian investors who can eventually become 1,000 years and then grow to become millionaires. That we can own the natural capital use the new revolutionary approach to using resources in a responsible and sustainable way. The word sustainable means sustenance. It means being able to survive. We need to be able to keep Ethiopia where it is today in its natural state at the same time that we're using it, not depleting it. The Industrial Revolution is about depletion. Depletion of capital, depletion of natural resources. It's not a sustainable model, and we're glad we missed it. We have the chance now to use natural, natural capitalism. We have a chance now to create 100 million wealthy individuals. And maybe we can start by the first 10,000. And maybe you can teach it with the puppets that kids can learn that this is important. That you know, what you have in your hands and what you eat is who you are. And who you are in your society is going to create a society that is happier, that is wealthier, that is more successful, and has peace because there is no internal conflict. Well-fed, self-sustaining organizations tend to do higher performance things than societies that are in conflict. And we know our population is growing. We know we have the resources. Maybe we'll find oil. Maybe we'll find gas. Maybe we'll find diamonds. Maybe it'll rain tomorrow. But one thing is for sure, if we take, maybe not 10,000 people, let's take 5,000 people and make a $50 million investment. All the tools are in front. There's nothing here to prevent us. There's no law, there's no army, and there's no outside force that will prevent us from doing this. They're waiting to buy from us. We just need to figure out how to get it to them. We need to do the producing. We need to go back to the countryside hook up with the farmers, take the notions of using what we have and building a business. And I guarantee you, there will be each of you sitting here next year in the next TED Addis, TEDx Addis, and talking about the million bucks, you, million burr you made, bucks also burr. Okay? That's my speech and I'm sticking by it. Thank you.